Cool. <laughs> now we're getting into your stuff. We'll get into yours right. So uh, thanks for coming yet again. This is installment number 48 out of 338. No, this is installment two. Today we're gonna talk a little more about the application lifecycle. Um, we're gonna just do a few slides, just kind of get into kind of demo heavy because we think we got a fun way to kind of chat, kind of demonstrate what the uh, developer lifecycle is. Uh, me, uh, if you don't remember from the last time, I'm a former DoD contractor, AKA uh, look out the window. Uh, went to Docker, been everything from PS to technical account manager to uh, sales engineer. I get around. Stack Rocks, Red Hat, pretty decent pedig pedigree. Uh, volunteer firefighter EMT, that's another fun one. So that is actively, that's actually me there in the middle in red. Uh, we were doing a burn a couple years ago. Zach, introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Zach Brady. Again, uh, if you don't remember me, I'm a field engineer here at RGS. Started my time off at the fort as former military. I was in the Navy. After that, continued along contractor out, former DOD IC contractor. Uh, did a few years doing that and came over to RGS. Love it, love the technology. That was my main reason for coming over. And I'm also a volunteer firefighter EMT. No is, relation, but. Yeah, that is not a requirement to work at Rancher. <laughs> It helps, but not a requirement. So yeah. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because uh, we've got the first installment of this where we kind of talk through what Rancher is. I think for, from an application standpoint, I'm going to kind of hit some highlights real quick. Uh, actually, let me go back and play this, and I'll start here. So really, really, it, just to kind of highlight, right, Rancher Government Solutions is really the tail that wags the doll with upstream Rancher and Sousa. Really driving a technology for uh, the US federal government, right? So STIGs, FIPS, SE Linux, all the things. This is really what we drive. Uh, yeah, SE Linux, FIPS, component, STIG hardening. We're the ones that are writing the, the upstream STIGs with DISA. We're the ones you know, advocating for FIPS 140-3, so really are the tail that wags the dog from a technology standpoint of view. And again, hyper-focused on the federal government not just here, but on the other side, on all sides of the uh, Potomac River, have you will. <clears throat> this might look a little familiar. I, I think Bob and I, we were talking about this a little bit about like, there was a lot of Google searching. And this is one of the things that we really are kind of, we kind of pride ourselves on is this idea that, right, with, with support, we really want to try and mitigate this about Googling and trying to find, you know, examples. Uh, all of our field engineers are extremely technical and extremely accomplished in both development ranks. Uh, I came from a sysadmin standpoint of view and, you know, years ago. So we really try and, and take care of everybody. Okay, let's talk about the stack real quick, just to kind of level set. Um, by the way, the burrito, I call this the 11 layer burrito, and actually it's funny that David actually was eating a burrito. Um, that's awesome. I, th I think really kind of, when we're looking at the stack, I like looking at it from hardware up. So looking at the very bottom, uh, the nice thing about our entire stack is you can run it anywhere. Dave's running it on a six node uh, laptop board cluster. I've got it on several little clusters. Zach's got it in AWS. I've also got a cluster in DigitalOcean. It doesn't matter where you run it. Uh, moving on to our first product from Rancher Government Solution, from Rancher, upstream from SUSE, is a tool called Harvester. And, and that's just hyper-converged. So you can run virtual machines, you can run containers, on the same host operating system, that would run your bare metal. So if you've got a home lab, if you've got a big lab, that's a great place to put it. It's also very big at the edge. We have a customer at this customer that you all work at that is currently evaluating it for a solution and replacement. I mean, ultimately, it's being able to do more with less, right? And especially when you go from VMs to containers, why not go from servers to VMs and then containers and Having them coalesced on the same hardware really helps. Okay, moving on to the operating system. Uh, especially with the news that came out of Red Hat last week, we don't care what operating system you use. Rocky, Alma, Oracle. I may remove Red Hat from this slide just out of spite, but we absolutely <laughs> support RHEL. We support Ubuntu uh, in terms of putting all of our rest of our stack on. It just works. Debian, all, all the operating systems work. We don't, we don't have an opinion about it. I may have an opinion, but we as a company don't have an opinion, you know. So it definitely gives uh, errors on the side of choice for, for you guys. Moving up, we're going to the container engine. Really, uh, we put Docker on here because you can actually use the Docker engine 
But honestly, Containerd is just built into our Kubernetes distributions. So honestly, this container engine just becomes an afterthought. You don't even have to think about it. Don't worry about it, it's just there. With, with our stack here, pretty much these four bottom container engine, OS, infrastructure, and hardware, that's all, we, we don't care about that, and yep. that is all obfuscated from you. So when you're interacting with Rancher, with our Kubernetes, with everything, you honestly really never see those aspects, right? Yep. When we get now, here's where we're getting to some of the meat and potatoes that, that you as app uh, developers are gonna interface with, is really Kubernetes. And Rancher has two distributions, one called RKE2, that is fully stig, that is our, originally was called Rancher Gov, um, kind of fun fact, but that's really geared for the stig, FIPS, SE Linux, all the things. Now here's the fun fact, we've got K3S. K3S is actually part of the seed for uh, RKE2. So think of RKE2 as the big overarching full product, where K3S is the stri uh, slimmed down, stripped down version. K3S is like 60 megs, you can, we have ARM versions of it, you can run it on a Pi, you can run it anywhere, it's really quick. So for you, Bob the developer, that's good, that, that, I'm gonna be repeating that a lot today. For, for Bob the developer, <laughs> right, air quotes there, it's actually great to spin up a single node VM that you can play with. It takes, uh, what, a second or two to download 60 meg binary, run the binary, now you've got a single node Kubernetes cluster with one binary, done. Right, the install is incredibly easy, or curl pipe bash. But, but as a developer, now you've got a full-fledged Kubernetes that doesn't have the cloud API, that doesn't have a lot of the other things. You can add them in if you want to grow that a little bit. But really, I see that as a great entry for like developers in terms of a simple development environment. For our, for our developers, we see a single node, K3S is pretty popular, and then Rancher Desktop as well. Yep. Um, those are kind of the two avenues you can take for local development on a Kubernetes cluster. Yep. So I've actually got Rancher to, uh, desktop running on here and we're gonna do some builds in a little bit um, and kind of play with some images and move them around and so that Rancher desktop that Zach brought up is a really good way for a local developer environment as well. Okay, moving up, we've got storage. So now you've got a Kubernetes layer, we're gonna use Longhorn for storage. Really the easiest way to explain Longhorn is taking the aggregate storage that's already on the VMs or nodes and being able to create high availability based on that. So in other words, you go to AWS, you say, give me a VM, they go, great, it's got 100 gig of disk. A lot of the traditional storage systems for Kubernetes is, okay, now I gotta go grab more storage, but I can't use that 100 gig that's there. Longhorn can, which is pretty nice. So you can take advantage of the existing storage you're already using. Or case in point with David on his uh, homegrown six node cluster, he's got disks already there, they're pretty snappy as NVMe, so he's able to take advantage of that with, it, with Longhorn. Um, the other cool thing about Longhorn, it can do encryption at rest. So as you start to think about you know, encryption and transit, encryption at rest with some of our customer facing stuff, that's kind of a great box to check. Uh, one thing to kind of highlight, it's not ultra performant by design, right? It's got high availability. So that's where you can start to think about if you're in a cloud provider, Longhorn would be a middle tier for storage, Localhost might be another version, another tier, but then also leveraging like EFS, EBS, or like NetApps, or three par, or big iron for, for like big databases, big IOP kind of situations. Okay, so really, you know, it's, it's there is no one right tool. I've, I've been on this little rant lately internally. There is no one right tool, but just having like, how many different size screwdrivers do you have in your house? I've got at least five or six different sizes from little tiny, from triples, what is it, triple zero all the way up to, to two or three of the big honkers. And that's kind of the point with the storage, right? Have, have a couple storage tiering tiers and away you go. And with that is also cost, you know, yep. is EBS is expensive, NetApps if you're running hard, or you know, bare metal is expensive. So if you can use the available storage for some of your applications, might as well use Longhorn. If you need a database, toss it on an EBS volume, you know, toss it on your NetApp, toss it, whatever Especially it in be. a developer environment. What's the, what's the quickest and easiest that's still the same abstraction as you would at full enterprise? Makes sense, right? Say again? <laughs> Usually it's whatever they have online. Yeah, yeah, I will say this customer is very specific about you will use this and you're like, okay, and you figure out how to make that work. But that doesn't mean like if they say you have to use a VM, great, I can run the K3S binary, now I've got a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I joke I made a, a career out of finding the wiggle room, the, you know, the loopholes. <laughs> okay, let's move on to networking. Here's the gist of networking. We, we ship with flannel, which is a combination of, sorry, canal, 
which is a combination of flannel and calico. I should put calico on this slide. It just works. That's the easiest way to think of it. If you don't have a reason to change it, don't change it. Let the, let the other sysadmins figure out why they need to change it. If they need to add you know, other networking things like service mesh with Istio. But the good news is we have an opinionated uh, version to deploy in the product. So it should be a single click deployment to deploy Istio or some of these other networking uh, technologies. We see a lot of customers here who, are, who have the requirement or have the, the need to use Istio. And we, we I, I always recommend, I think we always recommend. We do. You, you, you want to start, start with what it ships with and then move to Istio because Istio is complex. It's highly configurable, which is very nice, but it's hard to tackle Kubernetes already. So tackling Kubernetes and a service mesh can be difficult. Yeah, think, think of crawl, walk, run in terms of adoption. Exactly. Okay, moving on to our bread and butter, which is our rancher namesake. Uh, the, some of the really cool take, some of the really cool kind of features of Rancher is this multi-cluster management feature, where you can manage and schedule the, the cluster lifecycle with cloud providers. A cloud provider could be Harvester, could be AWS, could be anywhere. VMware, vSphere. Yep, absolutely. And so from the Rancher GUIs, you can actually go and schedule and start additional clusters. Now, obviously, from a developer standpoint of view, not that big of a deal, but from a single pane of glass from that same rancher GUI that the engineer, the sysadmins are scheduling clusters, is now you have the opportunity to interact with those clusters, same pane of glass, same expected footprint, and we're gonna, we're gonna actually do some live troubleshooting because I may or may not have deliberately broken an application for us to play with. Um, uh, what's your name, why are you here, and welcome to SharePoint training. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so yeah, so rancher's really cool for that aspect in terms of like a single pane of glass. But here's where it gets really fun, and we're gonna highlight this in our little like deep dive demo. We have CI, continuous, sorry, CD, CD, continuous deployment, built into it. So now you've got an opportunity to leverage version control as that source of truth, and to just say, you know, get push, and now the cluster automatically updates, whether it's a local, if it's downstream, if it's on AWS or DigitalOcean or in his, in his box, it doesn't matter. You can use that same methodology to manage every application on all the clusters quickly and efficiently. Think, think in your GitLab or Git version control pipelines. You, you're pushing an image, you're running your tests, you're linting, you're validating, then you're building your Docker image. And then at that point, when, once you finish that aspect in the pipeline, that's where Fleet can take over yep. and take your application updates, take that new image, deploy it out onto your, onto your cluster. If you even wanted to, you could have it spin up a new single node cluster to test on, right? So there's a lot of cool things you can configure with Fleet that is less complex. It can come ships with the Rancher Manager, and it's it's an Argo CD, but a little bit... It's lighter, it's lighter, lighter weight. weight. It's lighter definitely weight, yeah. lighter weight. It's easier to get into, where Argo and Flux have a lot more capability. But in terms of like dipping your toe, you know, crawl, walk, run, I think Fleet's a great place to start, and it's built in, so it's not like you have to go install something else, you have to have your admins do that or anything like that. We love it. And by the way, if you guys, if you guys have any questions, interrupt, interrupt, interrupt. You good, Bob? I don't really follow the stack to get the GitOps. Understandable, right? The, the, we, the reason why we're talking about this, just so you understand what's there, and you're, you're motivated to watch the riveting number one in the series of. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you interface with the rancher manager at all? Uh, command line. Okay. So you're running on the command line? Okay. We have some command stuff, yeah. Some of it's scripts and So we do have continuous deployment. What are you, what are you using for version control? Uh, GitLab. GitLab. Yeah, it's just Bitbucket. Oh, Bitbucket, okay. And what are you using for continuous delivery? Uh, well, it depends. It's a combination of things. We have still some Jenkins. Okay. You know, okay. And, yeah, whatever. and a guy named Bruce who, who copies the script every morning. <laughs> I, oh, Bruce retired. Oh, good for him. He was he was overworked. I'm not sure what they do. Yeah, continuous integration and deployment. So the good thing, whatever you are using, are we you know we sh with a. We ship yeah. with Jenkins, ship with Argo, we ship with the other products in the space, but Fleet is, you know, kind of our take on, right? Yeah, when you're, when we get through the, the that, actually you can continue to use Helm with Fleet, and we'll, we'll walk through that a little bit. 
when we show you the demo, really it's about what's the minimally viable kind of infrastructure look like. And it literally is going to be RKE2 with Longhorn Rancher leveraging fleet and new vector, like done. Yeah, I mean, somehow, I'm not 100% because I don't think I didn't set it all up, but I think once we push to uh, uh, Longhorn Rancher, it's going to be Bitbucket. Bitbucket. He's, like, um, he's so disappointed in that, like, big bucket. Oh, container? Nice. I'm a fan of that. Our, our stack knows that the image is updated and loads it up. I'm not quite sure how that all happens. Okay. <laughs> the pipeline itself isn't, um, isn't that important, but there, the fact that there is a pipeline is important. And I think for today's kind of talk, it's really going to be about how do we make sure you understand what tooling and what's available for you such that you can go, and if there's a change you want to make into your pipeline, then you can go to the app and be like, hey, come watch this video. I really want to do X. Usually it's, hey, from now on, we want you to use this. <laughs> oh, they tell you? Nice. Okay. <laughs> the goal of today is that you as developers kind of understand how all of this works on the back end, yep. so you're able to develop more efficiently and develop for Kubernetes a lot faster, a lot quicker. I actually have an agenda. <laughs> Application lifecycle, stateful, here, just zoom in on this. Right, oh, too far. But yeah, like stateful storage, we kind of talked about. Application management, CVE observability, we're gonna do that. GitOps, no, I'm not using, uh, let me change that, GitHub. <laughs> right, and then, like, pretty, we're just kind of like, kind of show one big crazy demo and troubleshoot an app and kind of show you how you would interact with Rancher and the cluster and come up with ideas and strategies on how to streamline all that such that you guys get to uh, quote unquote profit as fast as possible, right? Literally, Zach and I are just trying to make your lives a little bit easier. That's literally it. I am. I don't know about you, but I, I will definitely try. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, let's move up to monitoring and logging. Obviously, this is going to be more of a system admin kind of role, but we do ship with Prometheus, Grafana, and Fluentd built in. So if you wanted to get information about how is my pod performing, Absolutely, it's built in. If you wanted to leverage in a, a log collection, output it to Splunk, uh, there's a lot of different things. Elk stack, F stack, uh, I forget what the one that you guys are supposed to use, pressure wave or whatever. Um, I'm sure there are 17 new versions of the same service just because. Pressure wave is S3. Was S3, okay. okay. It's been a few years. Um, yeah, you could, you could write it to S3, it doesn't matter. That's up to you from an application standpoint of view. But that, we have charts built in to kind of, they're easy deployment. So this is where your system admin would take advantage of that and deploy it. You could obviously request it. Uh, moving up the stack to security. New Vector is our newer security tool, uh, relatively new to SUSE. I think it's about a year and a half old to SUSE. But really, that's going to give you that security observability. CVEs, have you guys ever had to fill out a POAM for an IAVA? Good, let the system admins handle that, sh that stuff. Um, <laughs> but they're gonna come to you and be like, dude, this container image is not up to date. And this is where at least you get that observability and understand why it's not up to date. And, and then we can kind of help with some of the strategies to make sure it is. Right now, you said you had Jenkins and Bitbucket, so that's actually good. So in theory, you should be continuously building every couple yeah. weeks, yeah, yeah, or whenever there's new code, perfect. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it, 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 at that point, you need to automate it and remove the humans out of the chain on that one. Are, like, you, are you guys running dev test prod or just dev prod? It's all prod. Sure. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> it's always prod. Come on. Well, there, we have Okay. Okay. But continuous to dev. Awesome. Prod, you have to. So are you, are you playing low and building high? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's fine. Now, there's an in-between, too. Hold on. Pause the video for a second. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we can talk offline about that. Um, cool. So, real quick on this, it's Kubernetes. We support the entire Kubernetes ecosystem. So, if an application, bit, uh, Atlassian, I think, was on here. There's your Bamboo and there's your Jenkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. Like, you want to use Splunk, Syslog, Elastic, uh, Sysdig, Elasticsearch, whatever. It doesn't matter if it's Kubernetes. If it's running Kubernetes, it'll run anywhere. It, we have way more integrations There's than more. this. This is what marketing chose, not even us. Yep. Fortunately, I don't have to know all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so moving on, uh, we'll be super quick with Project Carbide. So Carbide is kind of our uh, advancement. <laughs> Please refer to the data sheet for the quiz later. Um, basically, it's three products that we've added on top of Rancher's products 
to drive uh, more security for our customers, right? And it's really gonna be, the first one is the big one, which is around the secure supply chain. So anyone familiar with Executive Order 14028? <laughs> you will be. Um, this, is a, this is around software bill of materials. So all of our images, we provide that software bill of materials in a private registry online. And that's the data sheet that Zach pointed out. Kind of highlights some of that. Oh, there's a train going by, isn't there? Yeah. That's why, okay, that's why the projector, that way. But that's why the projector's shaking and I'm like, why is it shaking? <laughs> I was hoping my Alzheimer's kicked in. Anyway, um, so, so, so I was like, <laughs> but we're indoors. It must have been a train. Okay, so the S bomb really. So Executive Order fourteen zero twenty eight says all software needs. It's the projector, not the yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah, says that all software needs to have a software bill of materials. So we're providing that. And in addition, we're providing a cryptographic signature, and we're also providing a vulnerability report from when the image is created. Okay, so, so if you're ingesting images, so the, you talked about container yard, the container yard team would absolutely, should absolutely be taking advantage of that and pulling in those images and, and having the vulnerability port in the S-bomb. So when you have to, I, I love this alphabet soup. So when you're talking to the ISO about the POEM, uh, you know, because you have an IAVA and you need to tell them, no, 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 it's okay because we're using this version of OpenSSL on the S-bomb. Hold on, <laughs> okay. But it's there, which is great. And really, you know, you guys, you guys ultimately gonna be downstream consumers of that. So don't fret too much about that. That aspect of it is all for our rancher images. So every every one of our products, all of our images. It's a big so train. That's total, totally on the infrastructure side of the house. But yeah. it's a nice to know for you, but you most likely will never deal with that that aspect of it. Yep. Okay, number number two, which is also I think almost as big, is is what we're calling Stigatron itself. So if this is called Stigatron, the supply chain is called Suppliatron. And then we have Docatron. The air gap docu with Docutron. <laughs> okay, come on, Dave, it's funny. You're shaking your head there. Okay, so Stigatron is really around Stig observability. So this actually would, be, would apply to you guys, potentially. If you wanna look at the Stigs, it's still shaking, it must be a big train. Um, now right now, the Stig observability is for the Kubernetes cluster, RKE2, and Rancher itself. So not quite yet in your purview, but eventually we're gonna open it up to other uh, STIGs. So if you wanna understand the STIG for Fluent D or an application, this will help provide that observability and automatic reporting, automated reporting back to other like RMFA, CAS, Exact, or whatever those systems you guys are using today. Uh, Latte Art could potentially hook into it, potentially. I'm sure that that product's morphed dramatically over the last six, eight years. Okay. The third and not final is the Docatron air gap. This would be actually um, maybe not as valuable to you guys only because it is going to be around, I'll actually pull it I up I'd say it's you. valuable. Well, it, it is an offline version of all the docs for all of the Rancher products. So we'll go here, go to local, and then go to air gap friendly docs. And notice I have all the docs for all the products. Um, say, I, Includes Kubernetes documentation itself, which you yep. guys probably look at a lot, I assume, or a fair amount, right, for all the different commands related to pods, you know, PVCs, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Let's go back here. Uh, here's one good, here's one, obviously, I gotta get your ATO slide. Because uh, yes. there's, there's like 400 more uh, agency patches and logos and stuff. We're ATO'd everywhere. That's kind of fun to know. And then this is one of our highlights is the fact that like our Kubernetes really can go as far down as the tactical edge. Like Zach was talking about earlier, there's some fun groups over there doing some fun things at tactical edge with running Kubernetes in JRandom awesome and weird places. Um, we've been working with uh, a lot of different companies and the integrators like satellites to trucks to you name it, you can run Kubernetes on it. Uh, nose cone of a U2 plane, that's a fun one. And a couple other fun. Yeah, so there's K3S running in the nose cone of some of the U2s. F22 I think also has Kubernetes in it. I think they're using KubeADM, which I don't approve of. But. Also, we're also working with private 5G companies. Oh yeah, yeah. We're telcos. We're working with space. Tel like we're, in the, we're in every market and we operate there very well. Dave. I know. <laughs> 
I'm not getting rid of the slide because it's still cool. Okay, that's enough of slides. I'm done with slides. Screw slides. Um, we've only been going for about half an hour. Are we still good? But any questions so far? Okay, let's play with some demos. So. Oh, actually, since we're going on the demo, how does uh, can you get Rancher desktop to connect to a remote cluster? Yes. It's really easy. Do you have it network connectivity to that cluster? And you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, except it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Okay, so new. Hey, this is perfect for you, Dave. New developer. I log into Rancher. I can go to the local cluster, which is the administrative cluster. Look at the top. We've got import YAML, kube shell, download kube config. So I'm actually I've downloaded it, and uh, let me go ahead and go back here. I've got it in my terminal. Can anyone see that? I'll zoom in a little bit. I've got it running in my terminal, and if I do kubectl, I'll get uh, let's do node first day with the fingers. I'm so I'm talking to a remote cluster from Rancher Desktop running on this box on this on this laptop. Um, yes. Not the way I'm doing. It. Not with the Rancher Desktop application. Oh, ah, okay, that's a little different. Um, it loads the kube config file, but it, it won't talk to the remote cluster. So you want to see it in terms of Certificate issue, maybe? Nope. It, it just load, it only loads the local cluster. So oh, you want the I downstream. Have, I have the other. I have another context selected. It's supposed to be configured for the framework cluster, and it's only talking to local. Oh, so framework is a downstream of another. No, framework's it's on its own. It's not running. It's not running okay. Rancher in it. But it is K3X. We can, we'll talk yeah, that's that's a very weird edge case. It's your fault, not ours. Probably. <laughs> it probably it's the easiest is. answer, right? It probably is. Okay. So I'm gonna do some, so one of the things we kind of wanted to highlight, and that actually kind of brings up a good point, right? Is all the different ways you can interact with Rancher. So one of the things to think about is I'm hitting a single GUI. I've got R back in place. If you want, I can deploy Key Cloak and log in through Key Cloak. Um, I have it automated just because I'm a nerd like that but I can still use that as a single entry point as a developer, and I can talk to multiple clusters. Now, in this case, I don't have any downstreams, and the way I've got RBAC set up right now is it doesn't allow you to go to the local cluster, which is your administrative cluster. But I do my demos from local because I'm, I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment. So one of the cool things that, uh, you know, in terms of interact, interactability, interactive, interactive capable, well, yeah, interactivity, there you go. Yeah, that works, no. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, we've got a shell here, and one of the cool thing about this is that now I'm actually, I'm still in the GUI, but I'm leveraging my existing RBAC. So I can go and, and, and do debugging, in fact, we'll do debugging here in a second. Um, are you guys more command line or are you more GUI? Command line. I got one command line. I want, I want the new guy in the back. What do you say? Command line or GUI? Usually command line. Usually you, command line, okay. For command line? Probably. Okay. 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 Perfect. Oh, <laughs> you've been outvoted, Bob. Okay. But but the nice thing is the nice thing is if you walk over to someone else's machine, you don't have to have your certs. You don't have to have your config. You can just they you know if they can log in, they can pull up a shell potentially, assuming they have the same R back. Our our sys, our sys admins love this shell because we, we can they can take SSH access. Away from developers. That's a right? good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. So instead of SSHing into a node to run kubectl commands, are back to everything Andy said right here in the Rancher Manager, and you don't have to worry about all the complexities that come with SSHing the nodes. Yeah. And customers have done it. We're not just praising that to say it. Customers have done it, and it works very well. They have removed SSH access. It is forbidden. Um, cool. I'm gonna actually use my terminal because I've downloaded the kube config, and I like being able to hit the up arrow and have contextual highlighting and stuff, which I, and I can zoom in better. Okay, another way we can kind of deploy is, is I can import YAML. This is kind of a, not a good idea, just because of reproducibility. One of the things that we really are try and pride ourselves on is this infrastructure is code idea. So the idea is that everything, everything is code, everything is in version control. If you get hit by a bus on your way home, it can be reproduced by the next uh, poor soul. <laughs> you know, like the next victim. Um, always try and make yourself redundant and scalable. But the cool part about it is uh, we were talking about blue-green uh, 
uh, the last talk we were talking about how do we migrate between cloud providers or how do we upgrade a cluster and this idea of blue green where you just build a new, build with the newest versions, redeploy your apps, turn off the old. So your maintenance goes to zero because it doesn't, it's, just, it's Terraform up, uh, apply or my shell up or click, 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 done kind of approach. And then, if, then you, you know, if you can do it once, you can do it a thousand times. And then backups aren't as big of a deal. You just back up the data, use EBS, use Longhorn, have it back up to pressure wave and S3. There's a lot of ways you can kind of structure that. So it's infinitely scalable and redundant. I would rather Terraform apply or you know, hit, hit start on a GitLab pipeline instead of trying to go into a node yep. and running yum update and trying to update things yep. that way. I'd rather build a new cluster. Okay, so let's talk about fleet because this is kind of uh, the meat of the demo. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to delete these. Okay, so right now fleet doesn't know of any repos or anything. And what I'm going to do is let me go in here. I'll do the command line. Quick reminder here. So fleet, our continuous delivery tool, think of your integration between your version control, so GitHub, and your Kubernetes cluster. Fleet sits right in the middle right there. Yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete a couple namespaces. I'm going to delete Flask, Ghost, and who am I? And I learn to spell who am I. Boom. Okay. So I'm deleting these three namespaces, and there's a reason to it. And to, to make sure we're, we're honest, See, I'm getting page not found, okay? Here's my ingress controller, and I'm using uh, traffic only because it's got a nice GUI. I, I, Nginx is built in. I was telling Zach earlier today, I'm like, I'm probably gonna start doing more with Nginx just because it's built in. Patreon ships with traffic by default. Unless you yeah, turn but it not, off. But, well, that's my point, though, is you have to disable it. Yes, but it doesn't, but the traffic it, it ships with does not support TLS pass-through because that's based on the CRD ingress route TCP. Ask me how I know. <laughs> okay, so notice we've got seven. We've got seven uh, ingress objects: Longhorn, traffic itself, and Rancher uh, passes through here. What we're going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and add those objects to Rancher. So let's go here. We're continuously looking at our Git repos. I'm going to hit, and notice we now have three Git repos. All I did was tell Rancher. There's three objects. There's three version control buckets I want you to look at and deploy whatever's there. Hit add repo. Yep, good, good one. All he did was, he has a YAML defining these, these variables here. Which branch, where's the GitHub, how to authenticate against it, does it require a certain which path? So if we wanted to go take a look at it, um, it's pretty easy. I've just got that git repo, and let me know if you guys, if I need to go to light mode. But basically, it's just defining the object. It's literally just defining the object as saying, here's the repo, here's the target namespace, here's the path and the branch to use. Where's my application? What am I deploying? This is how you define it. Yep. And if we notice right now, it's coming up. We can go to who am I. Let me go ahead and... I'll close, I'll leave that one open because that actually makes sense in a minute. Okay, so fleets, uh, so my Flask app is up, but if we notice our dashboard, remember it was seven earlier, now it's 10. So it deployed Flask, it deployed Ghost, it deployed even the ingress objects for it as well. And if I go back to my app, oh crap, it's broken. We'll, we'll troubleshoot this in a second. Okay, but it automatically deployed. So here, we'll go to the one I haven't looked at. Ghost.rfed.io. Any bloggers here? Oh, it's not up yet. Ghost is running Java, so it takes a sec. Who am I? .rfed.io. Wow, DNS, all the things. That's fun. You had to hop off the Wi Fi last time, remember? Yeah, okay. I got to figure out. Ah, who cares? But trust me, it's working. Or not working. Well, here's the. Well, Chrome has been acting up on this computer. Like, it would automatically like uh, cache things that weren't there. Like, it was just acting funny today. We had an interesting problem with HTTP two, where it would truck. We had multiple things running on the. We it would like try to consolidate the connections, and data would end up going to the wrong container. Oh, there you go. He does have ghost up. Uh, see, that's there. You go. Here, I'll pull up a new Firefox, because Firefox didn't have this issue. So ghost.rfed.io. Yeah, and so it's, it's, I, think Chrome, I think there's a bug in Chrome right now. I'm just going to blame Chrome. 
But there's ghost, and then who am I also does the same thing. And there's who am I, right? And so the nice thing with who am I is we get the different images, the different uh, pods, which is cool. Okay. So one of the things, so we've got the we've got the dummy app. Let's actually drill into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here. Here's just kind of a look at the deployment itself for Flask, and we can see that we have our four pods. We're version simple 0.2, right? One of the things we can do is we can look at the logs. So we can go ahead and hit view logs, and notice right here, um, Chris is in development, but this really doesn't tell us a whole lot. But the app itself, because I've got debug turned on for Flask, you guys familiar with Flask? It's a Python web framework that's just easy to think of. Um, Demo app. Flask is the front end, Redis is the back end. Correct, yep. Redis is more of the hit counter, but yeah, I'm using it as a database. So it says here, I don't know why it keeps dropping me down, but it says, as I keep clicking on it, it says Redis Z colon 6379. Okay, so that's telling me it's looking for potentially a database. Let's go to our code, let me zoom back out a little bit. So if I go to my Docker file, Everything looks good here. I'm okay with what's here. Let's go look at my actual. Do you want to run through kind of the Docker file and what you're doing? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, yep. We'll do, we'll do the Python and then the Docker file. So notice, oh, okay, wait a second. I see it right here, Redis Z. Well, if we look at the app itself, I've named it Redis. So how do I fix this, Bob? Delete the Z. Delete the Z. <laughs> oh, that was too much. Yep. Perfect. Okay, well, yep, I saved it. I need to delete the Z. Now, what we should also probably do is change the version, right? Version up. We gotta change the version. You gotta change the version. Okay, we'll leave debug on. Okay, this all looks good. I'm gonna go to the Docker file. I haven't built it yet. Okay, I don't have version in here, but in terms of the Docker file, are you guys familiar with Docker files? David's, David is. Okay, so it's just creating the different layers, starting from top down. Um, do you see anything that might be a bit of a concern? I'm going to give you this opportunity to we save my life. We have a wonderful Rubik's Cube, if you can find it. Yes. Rubik's branded Rubik's Cube. So is this related to Reddit? Nope. Oh, Does anything jump out? No may be the right answer for now. We're walking you down a fun path. It's like choose your own adventure. <laughs> what do you think? Should I let it fly? I say ship it. Ship it. Okay, let's ship it. So I'm going to go here. I've got another tab open. And I'm using, in this case, I'm using NerdCTL because I'm using Rancher Desktop. NerdCTL is just a command line uh, alternative that can talk to Containerd instead of Docker. And that's what it ships with uh, Rancher Desktop. So I'm gonna do, oh, I gotta change the version. All right, we changed the version. Now obviously you would do a git push and this would go into version control and then that would do the build, but I decided to do it myself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and build it. Typically, yeah, git push, then your GitHub, GitLab, whatever pipelines yep. would build this for you and then push it out. But so. if you're doing local development, it's very plausible that you might build the image locally, right? Deploy it on a local yep. K3S cluster. Or whatever it may be. So notice I have 0 0.3, but what didn't change? What do I now need to do? My YAML, right? So we'll do this this way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in, oh, I'm not logged in here. Let me do it from code. So I'm gonna go to my YAML and version.2, I'm gonna change it to three, right? I'm gonna hit save. Uh, for some reason, even co VS Code was acting up today. So I'm gonna do... You have the update right there? No, but I had to click it for it to come up. Uh, I don't know why. So I'm just gonna enable it 0 0.3, and let's watch what happens. So all it's doing, I just, in, in my repo, I ticked it to said version 0 0.3. Come on, work! I did it from VS Code on my workstation. So, so you could edit your YAML here inside of Rancher, but you wouldn't want to do that because it's not reproducible. You want to do it yeah. in version control because Fleet is taking what's in version control and applying it to the Kubernetes cluster. What do you have in VS Code that allows it to be GitHub. 
It's just a git. It's just a git. Think. I could do the same thing with git git commit git add a git commit git push. Absolutely do the same thing. Um, notice now it versioned up to 0 0.3. Let's go back to our web page. Huzzah! We fixed it. Now, you want to take this full circle? Let's look at it from a security standpoint of view. Oh, I hate you. Like, Chrome. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to load in Firefox because... There we go. So you get a new vector, our security tool. Yep. Does a lot of things. It can do can registry scanning for vulnerabilities, right? It can do build time scanning. It can do runtime scanning. There's a, a lot to it. But Network observability is a fun one. It's a pretty one. Um, come on, Java. There we go. So it's looking at all the network traffic on Kubernetes. One of the main differentiators of NuVector from some of the other tools in, the, in this category is that it can actually uh, inspect and stop network traffic. All the other tools on the market, Aqua, Twistlock, StackRox, I've worked, I used to work for StackRox, all use kernel modules or eBPF, and they can only look at the metadata. They cannot stop the data data. And in fact, uh, New Vector ships with a log4j WAF rule, Web Access Framework rule, that'll actively protect any app against the exploit because, it, because it's an HTTP packet. They can see it, inspect it, and drop it. It is an active defense versus some of the others are, are reactive. Okay. Well, yeah, and it, but what does it buy you? This is important, Bob. Yeah. What does it buy you? Nothing. Time. No, it buys you time. So you can do it through your normal sprints and not have to, yeah. you know, so drop everything. Yeah. yeah. Instead of dropping a sprint to fix a vulnerability, you could just block any HTTP packet from leaving and then take your time to update the actual physical versions. Yep. Because there might be a lot. You don't know how many nested dependencies or what it may be for that single vulnerability, right? I still don't operate in this world. <laughs> it does. Okay. So here I've got um, I've got my uh, assets containers. I'm looking at all the images in Flask, and let's go ahead and look at Flask itself. And notice we're on version 0 0.3. I've got auto scan turned on. I can go look at vulnerabilities. Huh? We have some vulnerabilities. Bad ones too. Some bad ones. It's always like, oh, it's Python. It's always like open SSL, ah, uh, the Vix, the Vix zig, right? That was the thing you guys missed in the Docker file. Did you see it? Look again. Here, let me help you. I mean, how are we supposed to know that three five is an old version? Well, okay, so from an application, from a developer standpoint of view, this, this is kind of counter, but you have two choices. One, you can go 18, I think is the latest right now, or, well, I'm of the camp use latest versus pinning versions, but, the, but, but regardless of what you do, I think you should, uh, in your first run statement, Yum update. So if there's a delta between the base image you're selecting and newer packages upstream, shouldn't you try and use the newer packages? Again, you can version pin if you're production. I like to say production in production version pin in dev and test run latest so you can get upgraded as fast as possible. Right. That's a good. That's a really good way to say that. Part of the reason of version pinning though is that you have dependencies you know work. True. You get, you get a reproducible build every time. Yes. By letting it upgrade from the internet, you've now introduced potentially breaking. I codes. I agree with you, except people run peel it, and it never gets upgraded for years, and then they go, then they get exploited, and they go, why did that happen? It's because you haven't updated it in seven years. Well, that's a separate problem. Well, they, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and change. Let's make this version four, because we just modified. Container yard shows some of that. It does. Um, well, they, they enforce that now. Yeah. They, they made that a hard requirement. Of For what? Versions? They scan everything now. Oh, They're good. They're enforcing classification markers on things. Yeah. In the image as a label? Yeah. Yeah, on a label. That may or may not have been an idea. 
<laughs> well, they finally got around to it this past year. I'll tell you right now, uh, the team the team that's there has done a phenomenal job. I think they it, it they it was it, container it was built on glue of a few different technologies, with an in, but with an intent. I, I I hear you. There was an intent to use some formal products out there, but that customer doesn't want to buy anything. So then it's like, great. How do I? Where's, okay, who's got the bubble gum? Do you have bailing wire? You got duct tape, right, David? Let's figure this out. And then you know, I'm glad this is being recorded because you know. Instead of just buying the software for 80K a year, 89K a year, because I actually tried to sell it back, um, instead of spending 89K, we're going to spend 1.5 million on three people to engineer only, to, only five years later to be like, eh, it didn't work out. Let's shut it down. Uh, MASH comes to mind, right? There are long term projects that have been super funded and then not, and it's like, you could have just bought it for, and saved a ton of money. But anyway. I'll get off that horse. Okay, so we got everything updated. <laughs> Say again. I said I'm glad it's not my job. <laughs> yeah. So what we're gonna do is let me go ahead first. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not worried about committing the code, but what I need to do is I need to burn, build it. So let's build it. While that's updating, let me go back here and commit updates. Boop. And what are you gonna call it? CVE. Updates. Fixes for Bob. It's all about you, Bob. Yeah, so it's just it's just the um, We can do the same thing from the just straight from the command. Yeah, it's just the command it's just a VS code plugin. I think it's built in actually. It might be that is built that one is now. Yeah, I think that it one is, is yeah. built in. And it's built into the Yes. Yes, well, through he's Fleet. Logged into his GitHub account, and then Rancher just pulls his GitHub. Yep. And all okay. of this that he's done so far right now is currently available on the high side for y'all. This version of VS Code is in there. You can do it all in there. It's already available if you're using VS Code. Or IntelliJ, if you use IntelliJ. Oh, look. Oh, look. I get yelled at for using VS Code. Do you? <laughs> well, I, uh, we were excited when Adam was a binary. Remember, remember GitHub Adam? No, it was a binary. Then you didn't have to install anything. It was just a binary. And because it was a binary, we also could run it on Linux. Yep. Because some of us still had a mash where we could spin up a two core, four gig RAM VM with, I don't know, RDP X11 forwarding. Which they broke recently. Oh, did. Yeah. Okay, so now you can see we're up to date. Our app's still working, not to put you in any seizure, but we can go back here. Where was New Vector? Do, 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 do. We're going to refresh the screen. And we can go down here to Flask. So it's scanning, and it'll take a minute to scan. But if we go to the actual image itself, we can see that it's already picked up the change. So, really, right, in terms of day in a life, right, you would have. Your, your new vector or your security scanning tool, because this is more on the development side, right? It's great to be able to push things to continue out and wait for that scan, but you kind of want that information sooner. And that's a point in time. It's great, but it's a point in time. You need something to understand what's actively going on in your cluster right now, okay? There's another one I can kind of highlight here, which is kind of fun. And this kind of dovetails, so we're, look at this, we're, we're, we're getting cumulative. So let's pull up Longhorn. Longhorn, wow. First day with the eyes. Oh, okay, Chrome, you're dead to me. See, it works. So I've got some volumes here. Notice I have go a volume for Ghost, a volume for New Vector, and a volume for Flask. But really, it's Redis. Notice anything different about it? Oh no, let me help you. Do you notice anything different about it? What, what label is that showing? Why? Well, funny you ask, Zach. <laughs> no, but it's actually an encrypted volume, so it's encrypted at rest on the host. So here I've got, now granted I've only got a three node cluster, but each one of these nodes, you can go to this directory, it's like long, but I can go to that specific directory and it, the actual data file is encrypted. And then it's also replicated 
each node. Yep. So if he goes here and clicks that little drop down and deletes a replica, now you how can. Do you enable the encryption? That it's actually really easy. Um, Longhorn supports per cluster or per namespace. All you have to do is to create a storage class. Mm -hmm. You, you want to see it? Yeah. Before, before we do that, can you see this? You're going to have to wait. So you can see right now we're degraded, a replica is being recreated, and we're about to get back to a healthy yep. state. So that's if you lose a node, or it, say the network goes down, say you're running, you know, we're running in air gaps, right? Say you're on a different air gap, that goes down. No, we're fully healthy. Yeah. The other interesting thing about it is um, if you've got, you can absolutely create a storage class that only has one replica. So you can, remember we talked about that tiering? There's no reason why you can't have unencrypted and encrypted data as separate tiers. And the way I kind of did it, I'll show you the code in a second, but the way I did it is kubectl, let me go to my first tab. kubectl get storage class. And you can see I've got a default one, which is Longhorn, and then I have the encrypted one. Can you hit enter a few times so it goes up? What? There you go. OK, there we go. <laughs> you guys see it? Sorry, what do you, can't read off the floor? OK, so what does that code look like? Let me show you. Uh, not going to remember where I put it. Where did I put it, Zach? KDS Longhorn encryption. There you go. So I just create a storage class, and this is in the documentation. Actually, better yet, <laughs> look at us thinking, thinking this through. I can go to Rancher. I can click on Local. I can click on my AirGap friendly docs, and I can click on Longhorn. And in Longhorn, I can type encryption. And by the way, notice, because I did the search, it went out to the internet. But <laughs> um, the volume encryption, right, you can do one per you have to have a uh, crypt setup, which uses Lux on the host, but you just set it up one for volume, one for the cluster and one for, see it says volume key or global key for all volumes. So that's cluster wide or namespace wide. I think we both prefer per namespace. namespace. Multi-tenancy um, leaning. Not even multi-tenancy. If you're running, say, five applications, usually every application has its own namespace, right? Yeah, but I also but I also like the idea of well, it, it's it's the same kind of logical separation, multi tenancy. That we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, the one interesting fun fact is that see it says, yeah, see where it says PVC name, PVC namespace. So it, it's a bunch of tags, but the trick is you got to create a secret. With you got to create a secret. The secret name has to match the PVC name. The secret name has to match your persistent volume claim name. When those two match, that's then Longhorn's happy and away you go. Do you want to show the Kubernetes object for the PVC and the secret? Yep. Now what takes care of the variable replacement there? Those are uh, that Kubernetes. Those are just, okay. These are param, these are basically, these end up being annotations. That's the easy way to think of it. It just magic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Put it this way, every David, you know, all my code is available online. Yeah. So all this just works. And you can go. He said that last time, and then one more didn't work. What was it? There was something goofy. I forget what was going on. Long. Uh, yeah. There was a bug they were fixing. And oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so fun fact is, like, our, we're, our team is so technical. We're finding most of the bugs. We're coming up with two-thirds of the solutions. <laughs> Before our customers do. I mean, I don't know. I think that's cool to be able to do that. We've had a few circumstances where, like, say on like on a Wednesday night, we found a bug with SE Linux, right? We yeah. found it at 4 p.m. We had a fix by 6 p.m. and we had we had a workaround, but yeah, a workaround, not a fix, a workaround. And at 8 a.m. the next day, we had three Fort Meade customers hitting hey, us. Hey, I'm seeing this weird issue. Yep, we know about it. Here's the workaround. Things like that. So we're in a day to day. We've we've been where you are. You know, we've been in those air gas. We've worked with SE Linux. Yeah. FIPS, all that good stuff, right? Yeah. The other thing I kind of want to highlight here is the number of replicas. So if you had if you had data you want to put in a Longhorn, but you didn't need highly available, you could definitely create a storage class that's like not encrypted, one replica. You're on your own. Good luck. And still use the same uh, frame the framework Longhorn product to manage all three of those, and they would just show up as a different storage class. And then when you actually go into the app itself, so remember I said that the secret name is Redis, has to match the persistent volume name, which is Redis. 
And then you can be specific in the storage class name. So I could say, hey, use the uh, not HA super fast. I could even, uh, speaking of storage class, remember we talked about that tiering? I could have another tier that talks to EBS. Uh, vSphere CSI or right. EBS or EFS, and, and then it would then take advantage of that. And so as an application developer, you need to kind of just understand what storage level do I need? What can I live with? Am I giving you too many options? <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> Bob, here, here's an example. We say your front end of your app. You know, you could use that, deploy that on Longhorn in your local cluster, and then the back end database use that's the, a great one. Use the AWS CSI driver to have another storage class for EBS, and it would spin up an EBS volume to mount your database. And all of this, also all air gappable, it all works on C2S. It all works on Wild and Stormy when that comes about. So it's all in what? the inside. What's that? That sounds fascinating. Um, just out of curiosity, we're talking about databases. Anybody want to deploy a cockroach database? Oh, before you do that, type no. CSI. Type CSI. Oh, that's a good one. We even have it built in. So we've vSphere, Harvester. So we've got a lot of the CSI drivers that'll talk to the underlying storage. Um, the Dell CSI one is, the, the, is pretty good. The vSphere one is pretty good. Nutanix, the Weka, I forgot Weka was in there. But you already have it essentially built in with some of the like cloud providers, so AWS, GCE, GCP. So you've got a lot of options there for storage, a lot of options. Uh, Roach, anybody want to deploy a raft consensus algorithm, highly available databasing? Let's do it, let's let it fly. So we've been working from the command line for most of this time, but some, if you prefer the GUI, right? We, it's pretty easy to do the exact same thing, but uh, from the GUI. And again, everything in Rancher is GUI-able, you know, click opsable, you can click ops it, you can hit it with an API, you can hit it with a command line, it's all running the same thing under the hood. Yep. Oh, I should have given it an ingress. That would have been smart. But, Installing. Don't use Ingress, just use the Rancher proxy. <laughs> I can do that too. Um, what's it running under the hood? What's it running under the hood? Okay. I love that feature, by the way. That never gets old. So okay. That, are you talking to talk about the catalog now? Yeah. So imagine we've actually, I've got video of this. You can create a Git repo with all your Helm catalog with those little pretty images. Um, let me see if I can deploy it on this one. Here, uh, go to, just go to repos and open something up. Okay, there you go. Or if you want to add, you know, you can add carbides in there. I was gonna add the, I was gonna add the KPA one. But you can see that it's just a home, it's just a repo, right? So the nice thing is, is you can start to serve your own. Oh, yes sir, charts. So any of your applications, right, you could put them right in here. Yep. And so the cool part about it is, like, you could serve out, you, if your application is widely used, multiple different clusters, multiple different groups, you could serve yours out through a app catalog to Rancher. And then their developers, the system admins can go click, 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 deploy. It can be that easy. Is all this documentation also part of that uh, air drive uh, no, uh, yeah, it should yeah, be, it it's is. in the Rancher, it's in Rancher. Yep, in the Rancher Manager docs, it's gonna show you the catalog aspect, and then in the fleet docs, it would show you the integration there. So Rancher Desktop, Rancher Manager, what is Rancher? <laughs> Sir, you could probably search app catalog if you wanted to. Yeah, it's gonna bounce me up to, uh, ah. For some reason, this, this search is not working. Again, I'm blaming it on Chrome. Um, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's see, let's see if it deployed. So we're playing with that. Let's go back up here. Only user namespaces. Uh, let's go to all. And do, 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 carbide, cattle, cert. Could have sworn I told it to go to cockroach. Go to apps. Oh, it's pending install. Why are you pending? Oh, I probably don't have. 
Yeah, I probably don't have enough resources in the cluster. Don't you hate when that happens? Okay, let's delete it. Or it's probably waiting for a specific storage. You might have to set the storage class because you have two now. It's not going to. Well, one's it. default. Oh, one's default. Okay. Ah, ah. Well, here you want, okay, so I actually have my own version of that, of it, and a few others. So let's go ahead. Um, I have a shell script that deploys all my clusters. So I'm going to do min.io. This will probably break everything. No, go back. Go up. So there we go, min.io is creating new vector. So obviously you've got, you've got the command line to do whatever you need. Everything looks good there. Here we go. Min.io is terminating, creating. Actually, we can go to, the, where's Longhorn? I think I've got min.io using a volume too. Yep, it's attaching. S3 on a scalable, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, you can, you can slice and dice this. Turtles all the way up and down. Also um, Jenkins. Yep, so this little demo thing is deploying that. It's deploying Jenkins, deploying Harbor, and deploying another cockroach. So let's go back to the terminal. We can see Harbor's coming up, cockroach is coming up. Oh, code server too. Oh no, I didn't deploy code server. Let's see if let's see if ingress is going nuts. Okay, minio is up. You know what this is? Oh, it's HT. Hold on, is it? It's default image. Yeah. It shouldn't. I turned that off. Yeah, it's off. <sighs> is uh, Firefox? Rancor's not sending back a 503, is it? Or a no. 402? Or whatever it is for redirect. Like. The, the whole gist of it is trying to show you a couple different ways to deploy things. So there's min.io, we don't need my image anymore. Let's go back here. Roach is up. Cockroach is up. Come on, Gooey. Ooh, we're running in insecure mode. Dun, dun, dun. So I mean, you can get the you, you can see how easy this can. We want to get get it for you guys. What challenges? Let's flip this around. What challenges are you seeing today? We usually have a bit more of that stuff. We might have some new. We just turn it all over to our let's say. So I don't normally get to see any of But what about application debugging? The biggest problems that we often have is we have to get the search right, but <laughs> you know the search is difficult. So search, there's kind of two approaches. Terminate at ingress, at the front door, or terminate at the pod. I don't know. Terminate at the application. Uh, you know, just making sure we've got the, on his front, and that's not what you know, so that's, a, that's probably the hardest part is keeping the search up Oh, yeah, yeah, this, this is where I may or may not have a wild card cert for all of my rfed.io, because it simplifies, but um, you know each application, especially with Helm, typically you go and create a secret with your certs, and then you say, "Hey, application in Helm, use those certs, and it will create the ingress objects." Here, we'll take a look at it. Uh, see it. Hmm. That's fine, that's absolutely fine. So let's look at, uh, which one did I have? Rancher uh, cattle system. So kubectl get. I mean, 
mean the first time? It's a lot to learn. It is. There's a lot here. But the, the real key takeaway, right, is this section right here is under the spec of the rules. And really what it's basically saying is this is the URL, awesome URL. This is the port number. This is the service. Don't worry, the path type, don't worry about too much. But then TLS host secret. What secret should I use for that cert and CA and key? Now, if you're using a private CA, you also have to make sure you create a secret for the CA, right? The trusted CA. Or you could have it. They'll give you that. Yeah. Well, the public. They, they, they give, give you the public CA. You have to have the public There's CA. There's 72 of them. One, two, three. One, two, three. I'm probably there on seven, eight, and nine by now. Well, you can still you can still pass the full chain. Yeah, but being able the to CA be, bundle. So, I, like our problem though is that we want to we need to be able to do uh, two way. Yeah. And that uh, it doesn't work. Quite. So yeah, the the trick with two way that I've seen, especially with ingress, is if you're terminating at ingress. So in other words, the application doesn't understand. Two way, two way out, not two way in. That's a, well, it's a similar. Pods, pods need to be able to verify who they're talking to. Yeah, so you don't, you, well, it's true mutual. It's, two, yeah, yeah. it's double both ways. Right, it's, a, it's an external, it's a client to server and then server to client validation path. So in other words, the, the client says, I need to validate you. I'm trying to talk to you, but I need to validate you first before I send you anything. You get the, you get the cert, you validate against your local CA chain and go, okay, yeah, you're cool. Then you go, hi, I'm Andy, here's my cert, because then you're like, I ain't talking to you until you give me your cert, and I and so you go through the same process. But that works both for inbound and outbound to the service. I think really, the trick, the trick is really gonna be making sure that the application can understand that. And if you're terminating at ingress, this is what we used, this is, I worked on OpenShift 2.x years ago. I know, it was pods, it was, sorry, it was gears, gears, Mm -hmm. But the trick from the application standpoint of view is the thing that terminated TLS and said, okay, you are, your CN is Z Brady, whatever, dot, 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 whatever. I have to put that into an HTTP header when I pass it down to the application. And the application has to be smart enough to go, oh, okay, I need to look at that header for my user info. So from a developer standpoint of view, that's part of the problem. Now, if you're terminating at the application itself, then you need to go, okay, I need to pull that piece out of the cert, and then I'll use, like, so either I'm looking at a header or I'm looking at the cert, but I still need to consume that as a unique identifier. Okay, so that tells me you're terminating outside the pod. No, absolutely you are. <laughs> Ingress, you are. yeah. But, okay, so that's good. So as long as you've got a consistent header and your ingress controller knows to automatically do that and pass it off. God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was, when, when I built Container Yard, there was an issue that Five Eyes was using different, uh, different fields in the CN. So I would, so we, we with Container, we deliberately said, okay, this part of the field was your username and we could drop everything else. Other places were putting periods in weird places or spaces and you're like, how do I parse that? And so eventually, I, to, to, correct me if I'm wrong, they've standardized that, right? I think so. They were, they were working on that, COE it's all, and... It's all PKI. When I left, it was standardized. It was standardized, yeah. okay. That drove us nuts. Because then you're like, then I had to put in all these extra rules. Then like, if if it's this domain, do this. If it's this domain, like, stop. <laughs> For they backgrounds, got, I don't know. Did we go over Fort Meade backgrounds a little bit? What's Fort Meade? I was on contract six months ago. You were what three years ago, maybe? 2016 is when I left. Okay. Well, and then I did. I did. Um, I did like a six month uh, embedded support, technical account manager kind of thing for uh, the Oh, C last year. Yeah, last yeah. year, beginning of last year, which was fun. Um, that was the CKates team for local. 
<laughs> Stop. <laughs> did we kind of do some of this? Did we did we hit these? Keep keep Jack and I honest. Any other questions? Concerns? Anything you want to see? Should we stop the video and break out the alcohol? <laughs> um, a lot of you know, I, everything I, I know is mostly self-taught. Watching other people do it. Um, when I look at the Wonder uh, Land tree and I look at how stuff's organized, I guess it's based on how Kubernetes works mm -hmm. with pods. And I don't always understand all of that, but I'm getting there. You're getting there? Okay, so uh, he was asking about pods. So here's here's an opportunity. We'll go with pods in a sec. It's like when I'm looking, trying to look at my application, uh, people say, well, what's the point? What is the point? Well, here's a great way to look at it. In fact, I'll go back to this, because I think this is kind of a fun way to do it. You said pod, right? Right? Yeah, that's one, one of the things you see labeled a lot. Yep, okay. So I think that container, right? Container, pod, they're so interchangeable. Nope. Uh, I could, a pod is one or more. Here, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this yes. abundantly yes. clear, right? So a pod, right? W would you say a, a pod was what? A pod, a pod is a collection of containers. One or multiple. A collection containers. of containers, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Containers. Yeah. Container. Okay. What's, what, what I'm makes a, con being, what makes a container? I'm sorry, trying to explain this to someone who, doesn't even know Linux. Okay. Yeah. You know. So let's talk through this. What creates the container? Is that the, uh, the Docker image. Uh, there you go. Okay. Right? Does that help? Yep. And you can see them. And so when you, when you tell Kubernetes, give me a pod of n number of containers, yeah. <laughs> it gets created from an image. Okay, cool. How do I create pods? Let me do. We're going to rely on you. To, there's actually, hold on, one, two, three, four. I only know three. Four different ways to run pods. Oh, actually, I do know that. Okay. Yes. Yep. In, in Kubernetes, whoever invented Kubernetes needs to be stabbed in a dark. Sorry, their shins need to be kicked gently in a dark alley for YAML. That's like 138 lines to create one object. I agree. But yeah. No, that's. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. That's the part so, where we come in. We that's ranches that simplify all of this. So we got f at least at least 138 people in the room. What's the first one, Dave? How do I create a pod? Replica set. Uh, well, could we CTL create in, uh, replicas in run? Do you actually do you have you ever created a replica set object? No, you created a deployment. Ah, there we go. That's the one I'm looking for. Right, so, so which is specifically a replica set. Or, well, there's two, because there's replica sets and safety sets. And? Uh, right, so replica set. I'm going to go ahead and do, I'm going to do a pipe. Is that okay? Or should I do another one? I'll do a pipe. What, what was the other one? Um, uh, do you want to spell things out? Sta uh, staple set. Oh, replica. You said stateful set? Stateful set. What's the difference? Um, the deployment strip, the replication strategy, which in staple set or replica set just creates the same thing over and over, and over again. Staple sets are numerically right. Like, Why so is that important? Um, I suit the way they scale and volumes. And more specifically, host the name of the object, the name of the resulting pod. So what he's talking in a stateful set, if I want to create, say, uh, my SQL Redis, a lot of the databases that need to know about peers. If I, when you deploy, deploy, when you do a deployment with three replicas, I get deploy, I get uh, name, a random character, random set of characters, and random, right, so let's look at that. Yeah, the deployment has a random name, and then the pod has a random name as well. Um, should we pick on Flask? Really, you're now not going to talk to the internet? Well, we broke the internet, boys. Just open it in Rancher. 
No, the internet. Ah. <laughs> like, uh, try one more time. Okay, but you, again. No, I know, but raise your desktop runs the local Kubernetes. Uh, no, I don't, have, I don't have it turned on. But you see all this stuff, and then you can yep. explain some of how, how yep. the charts work. Yep, so, so the chart, so here's what I'm, I'm trying to build. I'm trying to build a mental map here. So I'm trying to build a mental map, and let me zoom out once. So it's all on one line, right? So here's a map. So a stateful set, like we said, is more about databasing. Let me do this. Let me, So I can zoom back in. You want to make okay. them like bullet point or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, get What's off that. This is my whiteboard. What are you talking about? Okay. What's another way to create a pod? Um, you have Dana set. Right. What's a daemon set? Uh, run the same thing on every node. Yep. Roster. What's that usually coupled with? Port. Oh yeah. So if, you're, if, if you want to run one per node and you want to leverage it to a specific port, a specific directory on a host, that usually gets coupled with host level privileges. So we'll, like uh, monitoring, metrics, um, GPUs. GPUs would be good if you've got one GPU per node. Although some of the boxes we've seen lately are like seven GPUs, like whoa. Um, that's a good one. Can you think of any other way to deploy a pod? You've also got just a run. Yep, run. Also known as a job. Yep. There's one more. Uh, I'll put it in the job one if it's cron job. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a type of job. A deployment aka replica set is n, n number of replicas with a fun naming convention. A stateful set is a very precise naming. Redis dash zero, Redis dash one, Redis dash two. A daemon set is one per node. All these create pods. Pods are made up of containers that are built from images. You are now, you have now passed the master class. Put it on LinkedIn. You have to. Kubernetes to me. DevSecOps. DevSecOps. Sec, sec yeah. DevOps. Stop that. Sometimes it's just a matter of looking at it long enough to get comfortable. Yeah. I think we will we will hopefully uh, hopefully we'll attach a couple Git repos. If not, grab our cards, ask for the Git repos, search for us up on GitHub. We've got a lot of this documented. You know, everyone stands on the shoulders of giants. So by all means, look at all of our YAMLs, look at our Docker files. And it's this, by the way, you can still find Zach trails of Zach and I internally. No, you, I know I'm still there's there's breadcrumbs. I'll give but, you my SID uh, offline. You can look at. I'll up. give you mine too if you need. Although, <laughs> just look at my last name. It's incredibly unique. But the, but the idea is like go look at what other people have done and kind of build on that. Now, if we take this a step further, before we do that, we also before we had, do that, we had a question between kind of Helm and the differences. I was just getting to that. Oh, okay. Because now we have an opportunity to discuss how we define these objects. And that's with Helm. Or. UI, what's another way? What is Helm actually rendering? Uh, it's, I don't know, it's talking to uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So, the reason why I say that is because if we go to my fleet, you saw this, right? It's just YAML. I don't have Helm because it was a very static kind of application. I didn't need to add in, because if you think about going back to, um, going back to kind of this mental model, is that Helm is gonna render YAML, which then Kubernetes is gonna use to build objects. Right. So Helm is a way to variable basically YAMLs and deployments and all these different yeah. things. So we'll say. Dry run. Dash dash dry dash run. Did they change that command? <laughs> you have to include client or server. Yes. Oh, okay. Obnoxious. Dash o yaml. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> so what I do is I export it and do do. Yeah. For so I can just do 
uh, dollar sign D O to automatically do a dry run. Oh, uh, you yeah, look at you. And also you, K. Look at you. Kubectl to K. Alias so you K. Can, no, 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 no. You just run ZSH and you include the Kubectl <laughs> plugin. Right, Wait, you don't use Starship or Fish? No. We're talking about. Oh, we're going way down the rabbit hole. But <laughs> so we've got. I'm gonna make this look. I don't know if you guys have worked with Yaml or with Helm or with Rancher or with Kubernetes. So I have some experience, so I can understand a little bit of what they're saying. <laughs> so if you have That's questions. Totally awesome. You know, like your first question to me, where do I start with all of this? Copy and paste. Wait, good developers copy and paste? Great, great, wait, no, good developers copy, great developers paste. <laughs> Think about that. Serious. Okay. Yes. So we got, what's the difference between, this is a good one, what's the difference between Helm and YAML? I'm going to pick on you, David. Um, Helm is the template, and YAML is the rendering. Yep, uh, it's abstracted. So you can you can do a lot of because it's templated. You can do a lot of variableization in it, such that when you actually go and I'll show you an example. When you go and deploy, I'll go to my functions here. Like perfect. There's there's new vector Helm chart. I can go and do dash dash set, and I can set some variables such that that Helm chart is reusable, and he can grab it and change a name. Um, I have a name down here for the domain. Where is it? Ingress enabled true new vector dot domain, right? I can, I pulled it out because I was playing with it. But like, he can take it. You can take it. Anybody here can take it. Change a variable or two and to fit their environment, so it becomes very reproducible. And also with Helm, you can have a lot of defaults, so you can just run Helm install, yep. and it will work. Or that's where the templated variableization comes in where you can change those with dash dash set. Would you say adding certificates is a very good, yes. would you say adding certificates is a very good variable to add to the home chart such that it just works? Yes. There you go. Okay. So we talked about Helm and how to create these objects. We talked about what objects, how are we going to get to it? Our world's greatest app. By the way. We'll, we'll pull it up in a sec. I got a fun question. For a Rubik's Cube and control of the board, what are the two most popular web applications over yonder? At least they were years ago. I'm assuming they still are. At your customer, the most visited internal websites. Every all, day. All unclassified. We're not talking about anything like that. that. Nope. <laughs> uh, that's number three, I think. Is it down? <laughs> is it down? That's actually probably, that wasn't, we all had our own version of that because it was that bad. Now it's been standardized, it's actually like a service. No, it's actually a service with its own group, its own contract, everything. Yeah, yeah and so is Key Grabber. Yep. I managed that and ported it over to a container, to a gear even, and then to a container. Oh, no, no, yeah, that was, I've, I've managed that for a while. Back to the question. Back to the original question. Okay, Daily Puzz is number two. Number one. Cafeteria menu. Oh, really? Wow. Yep. Uh, <laughs> does anybody know who Nate Burton is? No. So Nate, Nate, when he was working on Latte Art, had access to all the some of the metrics and stuff, and that's where that part like, partially came from. So I, I get to keep the Rubik's cube. <laughs> okay, but uh, trust me, I have plenty at home. So, the, so how do we get to our stuff? Sorry if I'm thumping my chest. How do we get to our, uh, what kind of object do we need to actually get to these applications? How is my application running in my pod? How, How do, do I, I get, get to, to it? it? Yeah. There's a couple different ways. There's, I can think of one, two, three. Four. Three. Oh, four. four. No, three. Four. You're saying where do I Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is four. It is four. No, because I, like the, okay. So let's start, let's start close in. Okay. Kubernetes uses what's called uses labels full stop. So when you when you have your pod running, which is of n number of containers, right, from an image, you put a label on it and you say app equals daily puzz. Doesn't matter. That, I don't use the recommended label these days. Say again? I have a Kubernetes stuff. App.io. Yeah, you're supposed to use no, the kube, the kube CTL doesn't default to that, and that doesn't make any sense. Oh, I forget the name of the notation, but yeah. So you have a thing called a service, which points to the pod, or points to the label. 
the label points to the pod. Actually, there's another, there's an endpoint in there too. If you want to get down at the <laughs> Not that level, but thank you. Thank you, David. So there's four objects that Zach and I were kind of talking about that point to the service. Think about the service as an internal load balancer, right? You can, there's some tricks you can play with the service to say, this, gets, this, pod, this set of pods get weighted more, this label gets, actually more specifically, this label gets more weight, this label doesn't, I'm only load balancing these. So as these pods come up and down with these labels, it's independent of the service. The service is like, look, I got a port, and I know I'm shipping my traffic off to some pods, that's all I know, okay? How do I get to the service? This is the four that comes in. David, give me one. No port. I wasn't going to start with that one. Let's start with a different one. Um, ingress. Cluster IP. <laughs> Thanks, David. Because they actually are cumulative, if you didn't know this. Uh, they are. What do you mean cumulative? I'll explain this to a sec. So a cluster IP gives that service an IP address on the internal network. And let's see if, let's see if the internet's up. The internet. The internet. There we go. See, it works great. <laughs> We didn't need it anyway. Screw you, internet. My cluster works. Oh, get out of here! <laughs> if you're on your phone, come on. We're we're uh, we're being we're, we're right. So cluster IP creates an IP on your local network to the service. Remember how? Remember Redis Z? Well, specifically inside the cluster. Yes, this is only inside the cluster. That's a very good point. Remember cluster Z? So I had an application running into a pod, trying to connect to the service. Redis Z, it runs internal DNS to get the cluster IP, and uh, internal DNS goes So that's why it failed, right? When we change the name, the pod goes, oh, no, no, I meant Redis, internal DNS, also known as core DNS, goes, oh, I, I know what that is. Here's your cluster IP to the service. Does it know because of the label, the service, uh, how does it know? Okay. A DNS entry gets created off a cluster IP, All right. which points to the service. And the service is looking for a label, and then the pod is going to be labeled whatever that label is. So yep. that so Redis let's try label this. was what it was looking for. And we had it as Redis Z when it was supposed to be Redis. Let me try my phone. Man, you guys, you guys can't get good internet. Wait, if you're, how are you streaming? Oh, you're hardwired. What, uh, what Wi-Fi are you on? Lion's Den? Oh, oh well, that's... that's uh, I accept. Cool. Oh, I love Unify. Done. Uh, do you want to hop on this? Ninety four. Wow, something, something's good. No, I'm just gonna keep rolling. I'm not worried about it. Oh. Okay, so cluster IP. There's a, so cl cluster IP was an internal IP, right? So this is why it's cumulative. I think it's cumulative, right? Because from a cluster IP, I can do what's called a node port. Well, it's a different type, it's a different type. So we'll do it like we'll do it like that model, right? But what a node port's going to do is it's going to expose an, a port on the host that points to the service. Actually, that points to the cluster IP that points to the service. Uh, and I think it does it on all hosts. Correct. What? So, so it exposes a, a high port, so something thirty thousand or greater. Thirty thousand or greater on all the nodes in your cluster, and then you can visit any. Nodes IP at that port and it'll internally route the traffic. What routes it? The CNI, the network portion. Nope. Coop proxy. Uh, yes. And IP tables. To then mm -hmm. the cluster IP, which then takes care of it. Right. So, then it, so, in other words, you're coming from the outside to a specific node. Where has this become fun? I don't know. I'll scroll up. What? What deployment mechanism? Is this is a node port really useful with? I said it earlier. Yeah. 
a daemon set. And the reason being is because you can actually, it doesn't have to be 30,000 or higher. If you've got net admin privileges, so we can think about, um, but if you have, if, if you're allowed to do that, if that application's allowed to do that, you can have it directly listening on a, on a lower port. Could you use it for SSH? Yep. yep. If 22 wasn't already open, you could grab 22. FTP, 21, come on guys. DNS, yep. What's, uh, here you go, let me, let me pull on, LDAP. 3389, 3389? Ghost was 2370, uh, no, tw yeah, anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> What's another way to get there? So that's the port you would expose? Yes, but the, so the nice thing about Damon says is it doesn't go through the coup proxy, it goes straight to the pod. And then it looks the internal cluster IP based on the label. Well, yep. you, would go, you would go through, the, you'd be locked to one host if you're doing a node port. Yes, yes. 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 remember, we, we talked, uh, I'll screen scroll it, but it's all Helm or YAML or the, the UI to kind of de de so describe this. Tricky. Well, so, so really this, this, is, this is the menu of how to do it and what to do. And we can kind of talk about some of the scenarios why you would pick one or the other. But the idea is now you understand all the fundamentals. Put it this way, we're giving you a box of Legos. What do you want to build today? Okay. That's fine. But, but at least understand that like uh, your car can do 100 plus miles an hour. It doesn't mean you have to. I mean, if you're running a few minutes late coming here this afternoon and people get out of your way, you could absolutely do 135, allegedly. I was chasing a Tesla. <laughs> but at least you know you can, not that you have to. That's kind of the point. Okay, what's another way to get into it? Thank you, that's my favorite one. What does ingress require? So ingress is literally what? Actually, let's pick on somebody else. Zach, what's ingress? What's an ingress object? Way to define. FQDN? Yeah. Your FQDN to what? To a service. Bingo, that's it, just FQDN to service. And then you have a controller that watches for those objects and then actually, say, and then ha that's where you're gonna have 80 and 40 listening on. Like I said, I had traffic running. Yeah. Everybody uses ingress. It's either gonna be Nginx or traffic. And I, huh? Who's using cat? Oh, because I know, yeah. <laughs> no, I've seen, I, I have seen caddy. Because like, it's so much yeah. faster. Like, so like, we'll have a namespace with a lot of, uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> but they just talk to each other internally. So? Those are easy. How do they talk to each, okay, this is a good one, Bob. This is a good quiz. How do they, how do they talk to each other internally? We use a port, but it's just a name. Okay, so you're using a name. Yeah, okay. What, no, no, to get to the pod. Yeah. What is the internal load balancer for pods? I don't know. Uh, is that the service? Okay. Right, because the service points to a label which points to a pod. Right. Huzzah. Okay. There's one other thing we forgot to add to our where list. To know that a service has to be of one of those types. You can't just have like a bare service. Correct, yeah. Unless you're there's one other type we haven't talked about. I know we've said them all. Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, load uh, balancer. Uh, Learned. Yeah, yeah. What is a load balancer, Zach? Wait what, is the diff what is the difference between a load balancer and ingress? Well, actually not ingress. What's the difference between a load balancer and, a, and like a cluster IP? One's internal, one's external. Yep. The load balancer will reach out to the cloud API, to AWS or some other external service to create an external load balancer that points to and routes into the service. It doesn't have to be external. No LD. Yes, it does not have to it be. It doesn't have to be external, right? But that is Coop VIP. Be, that's going to be or Clipper. That's going to be external to Actually, the cluster, though. Speaking of K3S, Clipper LB. I have to know this stuff. Well, here's a. <laughs> Again, this is about the menu. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can eat, you can eat on the extra value meal all day long. <laughs> all of this is quite pretty relevant to all the developer side because you have to develop your applications to be able to work with all this. So yeah. as you went up, 
might be totally in depth with it, but it's nice to know how you're able to develop applications, right? Yep. Okay, so. Does that help? Does that does that help? <clears throat> Talking through it does help. Cool. Um, connecting this to you know what you see on the Rancher UI, and then connecting that to what you put in your YAML file. Sometimes I can't remember if they use the same words. <laughs> no, they do. They absolutely use the same words. <laughs> so Ranch, the Rancher manager is just a GUI for Kubernetes. Yeah. So all it, all it's doing is reading RK2 under the hood, it's just displaying the information. Bad my cluster might have blown up. Do, uh, RancherFederal.io. Rancher.RancherFederal? Yeah. Same? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Oh. This hurts. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, good. And it's a little bit easier, I say, with the GUI to show it, right? Than showing them an actual bare, you know, plain YAML file. At least I prefer to show the GUI because it, 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 for someone who's not as familiar, it's easier to look at, easier to see, easier to read. So. <laughs> well, he, here's. The GUI does not map it out in like the one to one to one kind of like how we were doing it, right? So you can go into an app. What was that? So we use a bad password. At <laughs> least we're predictable, David. <laughs> well, actually, before you do that, go to just go to workloads. Yeah, so it's good to. So you can see everything we talked about and that document's going to be listed right there, right? I understand what the difference is between cloud jobs and things. And then go to service discovery. Dude. I saw them, I didn't know what they were. You literally are the expert now. <laughs> and then there's also, uh, we didn't talk about HPAs, but basically that's just the thing that looks at the metrics of the pods and says, oh, I need more, I need more, I need more, or I need less, 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 and you can define the guardrails. But you can see that all those object types are all listed out. Services, ingresses, pods, cron jobs, jobs. You got yeah. storage, PVCs, PVs. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, the other thing you can do is also scope down per namespace, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what's uh, what's a great what's a good way to think of namespaces? It's two words. Uh, <laughs> Logical separation. Uh, okay. And the reason being is because okay, I've got a bucket. I need to kind of slice and dice this a little bit logically, where. Clusters, because remember, we can manage multiple clusters. That would be more of a physical separation. We can do physical separation at a network layer. We can do it at a storage layer. So, you, so again, thinking about how building out your solution, logical separation, physical separation, you can kind of build the best of both worlds. And one of the cool things that, that the GUI does bring, notice we're all running cluster IPs. So a cluster IP does not have an official way to get to it, right? From external. Cluster IP is internal. We have stuff that's headless. Um, let's pick a good one. You got new vector. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna do Longhorn. So notice Longhorn front end right here is an HTTP service that go, that remember the, hey remember the labels. Bob. Sorry. Remember the, the label selector. But notice Longhorn. Right. Notice right here. I've got a little HTTP. So now I, I just got to the service through the rancher proxy. So that's a kind of a fifth way to get to it is through the rancher proxy. Take, take a note of the path, right? So you're, you're going to the service, to the, to the pod with the port, right? That's kind of breaks it out. No, even, even more specific. Namespace, service, yeah. port. Yeah. Okay. So you can access your application through rancher, through RBAC, so right now, this is all done through our back, and it's controlled by Rancher, and that's using the Rancher proxy, so you can do it yourself. Right, and that's under the services. Yep. Right. Yep. Service, service, service discovery services. So that's that, right? So, so if you're in development, could I use that instead of Ingress? Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Here's also another fun fact. Um, and let me see if I can show this to you. So here, I've got this your, oh, let's go back to that. Um, actually, I'd be able to go forward. Right, so here's Longhorn. I'm gonna pull up Safari. I've never authenticated. There's my wonderful website. Do, 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 visit this site. Because he didn't log into the Rancher Manager. Oh, okay. So what advantage, what advantage does this provide? Sure. Our back. Authenticated yeah. access to any oh, of your okay. applications. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. And oh, by the way, his, his cluster is, is, has authentication through GitHub with OIDC, to, OIDC tokens. Yep. I've got one for, I don't know why mine's down, but I've got one for Key Cloak. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, go to, go to longhorn.rancherfederal.io. So, so, so right now you can access Longhorn two ways. So the Rancher Proxy, which is protected as we see here, or if you use Ingress, you're not going to have protection unless your application has protection, right? You can see you can get the Longhorn, though. So you totally can get Ingress to it. is not protected, right? Now, so the application could have its own authentication mechanism. Right, which which obviously I think you should just because of logical separation, this app authenticates because you don't want every user to get to every app. But actually, you wouldn't need authentication because that would be your mutual TLS PKI layer, in theory. But you can see how we can kind of layer this, and we can have a more in-depth conversation with you and how your team's doing things as well. It's you know. Uh, I'm just trying to put it in my head long enough. <laughs> okay, better yet. How about this? We're going to post this text document to, to GitHub and we can give it give you the link for it. Even easier. Grab your phone. No, but he can't take our GitHub in his office. Eat. Well, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I was going to make a gist anyway. Just take a picture of it. Wait, hold on. <laughs> So here's, here's one of the nice things that like Zach and I have been able to do over the last year or so is that we, you know, this is a tech talk. You guys, are, you guys are watching. The other thing we can do that we, that we absolutely enjoy doing is workshops where we'll spin up a bunch of VMs that should stay up, <laughs> but we'll spin up a bunch of VMs and then you get to play. And that really helps solidify that knowledge, right? Come outside. This is a great location. We can run a workshop here. And, and really kind of get you guys with your hands on. And we can gear it more towards system admin, we can gear it more towards developer, we can do both. We can go after a specific project, uh, product in our... Yeah, we've done you know, a, a three hour workshop. First hour and a half was infrastructure. You know, last hour yep, was done that too. developers. So there's many ways to structure it to help you guys. If by any chance you wanted to understand wild and stormy AWS potential features, we may or may not have a workshop for that too on AWS. Hint, we, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We did a workshop three, two weeks ago, three weeks ago three. with the actual AWS folks who support Fort Meade who are deploying Wild and Stormy. And we did a combined workshop, Rancher, with AWS. So we can gear these workshops many ways, bring in partners. If you're working with Elastic, you know, we can bring in Elastic. Do a work, we've done a workshop in the past with Elastic and Rancher. You know, we can bring in our, the different industry partners and help you guys out. Yeah, product specific, in, environmental specific, infrastructure specific, application, spe you know, application developer, security. We can bring a physical server, deploy Harvester, right? We can do many different things. We can? Oh, yeah, we can. We can do that. No, but I mean, it, but. It, it's fine because it's more or less about Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. <laughs> But I, th I think tell for, your assistant to email us. I think I think for okay, we're going to pull a firefighter analogy. But the fact that you know the amount, the, the sheer number of the amount of tools on every fire engine, I'm now driving them now, which is oh, totally fun. But the, I was thinking about this: all the different tools to do, you know, fire suppression, breaking into cars, medical. Uh, we've got a tower truck with. More, even more tools for you know, extra water vehicle rescue. extrication, water rescue, right? All the different tools. This is, this is why I know Zach and I really love working for the company is because we have all those tools. We can pick and choose the right tool for the right job, right? And then as a developer, as senior DevSecOp, engineer, DevSecOp engineers, you guys, like I, I, I thoroughly enjoy being able to teach all the different tools. And then you guys get to pick for your mission, for your day, for your app, for your geolocation for your compute envelope 
So it's really about having, you know, understanding all the different tools, being able to pick and choose. I may or may not have an article on Intel news coming out in three, four weeks about that. Did you guys see the Prime Video? Announcement. It's, it's in reference to that, and I pulled some. I pulled some few other references about like digital. Uh, Dropbox went from the cloud back to bare metal because it was cheaper to go bare metal, uh, more control, right? So there's. Well, everyone's like, yeah, go to the cloud. Some people are like, whoa. Uh, he, he converted a workshop environment from one cloud provider to another. It was 10x more expensive on the provider he picked than the one I use. Yeah. So again, Literally have, 10x. It, no, it actually was 10x. <laughs> Can't tell you. Okay, damn it. I used DigitalOcean. It was 60 bucks for me, and it was 660 bucks for him. It was literally 10x. Well, build nickel and dime you. Yeah. He could have used LightSail, which is a little more predictable, but yeah. My Ubuntu 19 droplet has been updated many times. <laughs> I need to move it. I need to give it a new droplet just because it's like. They've had so many new features since then. Yeah. Are you guys good? Thanks for coming. Anything? Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And we're out.